Hello, cruel, cruel world. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. You can call me the ominous Shahamanus. The Prime Minister of England and Wales, Boris Johnson, has not showered himself in glory recently. There's been humiliating parliamentary defeats. There's been anger over lockdown breaking parties in Downing Street. So this has happened in the very recent future and he's been fined within the last couple of days. He failed to contain the coronavirus in the early days of the pandemic and it was dubbed by parliamentary report itself as, and I quote, one of the most important public health failures in British history. It's not a great look. There was a time when Boris Johnson got into sticky kind of situations and the public would just kind of laugh along and they would chortle. He would make inappropriate comments and remarks and he would get away with it. But I think the tide is turning and he now faces his highest degree of unpopularity. So who is Boris Johnson? What are his personality traits? How has he managed to wriggle his way onto the very highest echelons of British politics? Does aspects of his childhood and adolescence give us any clues about his recent behaviour? And how does, why should we uh, not be surprised by him breaking down the lockdown rules? Why is it on brand for him? On top of all of that, what are some of the most famous lies and offences comments that Boris Johnson has made? What are his, some, of, some of his biggest controversies? I'm going to answer all of those questions and many, many more in this episode. So sit back, relax, grab your whiff waff paddles and welcome to A Psych for Sore Minds, the channel you should watch if you like your true crime with a twist of psychiatry. Okay, so to start, I'm going to dissect Boris Johnson's early childhood and his adolescence because I want us to kind of understand how this all shaped his personality. Before I do that, I'm going to give you a quote which I think really sums up Boris Johnson and I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you, dear viewers, my psych for sore guys and gals, who said this quote? Answers later on in the episode. The quote is, there are no disasters, only opportunities and indeed opportunities for fresh disasters. So have a think about that and we'll talk about it later. Okay, so Boris Johnson. He was born in New York in June 1964 and he's of English, Jewish and Turkish ancestry. He was actually born Alexander Boris de Falafel Johnson, but he's always preferred to use the name Boris. Because let's face it, we can't really have a prime minister called Falafel. And if you're being really pernickety, it's not actually Falafel, it's spelt P-F-E-F-F-E-L, so Fleffel. But if you didn't like that joke, well then maybe you need to work on your sense of hummus. So Boris Johnson actually had a very troubled childhood. He grew up in a house with domestic abuse. So his father, Stanley Johnson, had a very violent temper at home. In fact, he actually broke the nose of his first wife, who wasn't Boris's mother, and she had to go to hospital. On top of all of this, Boris's mother suffered from severe depression and had a nervous breakdown. And her suffering would play on the mind of young Boris. And his father once said, and I quote, it's a strange idea that parents should talk to their children at home. I never read to them or ask them about their homework. I relied on schools. And I have to say, I've got two kids myself and I must admit that I might be a little bit overzealous with using the iPads when I want a bit of peace and quiet. But from what Boris Johnson's dad was saying, it sounds like his, he was just neglectful towards Boris. And I think that would have impacted Boris Johnson's need for attention, his craving for attention, which is a relevant personality trait, which I will get onto eventually. Be patient, young Padwan. The other thing is that his mother suffered from depression and she spent periods in mental uh, health hospitals, which obviously would have affected the kind of stability and the home environment for Boris. Uh, so uh, in the context of all of that, Boris distrusted his unfaithful father who was regarded as a womanizer. Perhaps somewhat ironic because Boris Johnson himself repeated this pattern by repeatedly cheating on partners. So that makes you wonder whether he undervalued women because of his father's attitude. But regardless of all of that, I think we're getting the picture of a young child who's perhaps scared, who has very little warmth, love, support, 
stability from his parents and from his household. So he's got a, an, an, an emotionally unavailable father and a literally unavailable mother who spent a lot of time in hospitals and a lot of time lost with severe depression. Okay, another interesting aspect, I think, of Boris Johnson's childhood is this. He was, until the age of eight, he was actually severely deaf. Sorry, I said, until the age of eight, he was severely deaf because he had glue ear, which is a prolonged and painful infection. It was quite serious. He needed several operations and he was also in pain in his ear. It kept him in bed from extended periods of time. So why do I think this is relevant? Well, of the, the, the obvious kind of connection is that it might have added to his sense of inferiority that stuck with him for most of his life. But another theory is that his evasiveness actually goes back to his childhood. So he has reported in interviews that he couldn't hear. So due to embarrassment, he would just sort of say whatever came to his mind. So I think that that's stuck to a degree when he's become a journalist and a politician. He would just say whatever's come into his mind, not necessarily answer questions relevantly or say things that are relevant. And I think that habit has stuck with him. I mean, having said that, politicians are not renowned for answering questions directly, but I guess what I'm saying is I think that Bojo has got that trait more than the average politician. Okay, let's move on to his childhood and his life. So, the parents of Boris packed their son when he was only eight, uh, sorry, 11 years old, off to Ashdown House Prep Boarding School, which is in Sussex. And this is 1975, and he went there for two years. And that was basically to permit him or to prepare him to go to Eton College in winter. And this prep school was strict, man. So it didn't permit crying. And if pupils were found crying, they would be punished with a beating. To be fair, I don't permit crying in my household with my kids. And if they do, I force them to watch a Dr. Grande video. Oh, no, he didn't. And this gets a little bit sinister, but former pupils of the prep schools have made allegations of physical and evil se even sexual abuse of the pupils in the 1970s. So in March 2017, a science teacher from Ashdown House received a 12-year prison sentence for serious sexual assault on a number of boys during the 1970s. Now, I'm not saying that Boris Johnson was assaulted, but I'm just saying that he obviously was living in a an environment with little love, little support, little safety, possibly. And I think this all kind of contributed. I think it all built up and may have added to Boris Johnson's uh, emotional void. OK, so then Boris Johnson goes to Eton School. So if you're from England, I assume that you'd have heard of Eton. For my American brethren and other foreign brethren, Eton is extremely posh. It's like the upper echelons of where privileged uh, children, multimillionaires, etc. go. It's kind of like if a school was Bridgerton, it would be Eton. Uh, it is kind of the place where Prince Harry and Prince William would go. In fact, not only that, it was the place where they actually went. By the way, if you're interested in my psychoanalysis of Prince William, I've done another video on him uh, and him and Meghan and some of their personality factors, etc., etc. Go and check it out on my channel. So just to give you um, a brief kind of um, context of Eton, uh, people that went there would include George Orwell, Ian Fleming, David Cameron, and even Loki from The Avengers. Whilst he was in Eton, his class teacher wrote that Boris Johnson was, and I quote, free of the network of obligation that, and blames everybody else. So does that sound familiar? Somebody who's high up in politics, who refuses to take any responsibility, blames anybody else. I'm thinking of a, a certain orange, small-handed ex-president. So I think all of this stuck with Boris Johnson. It was there at an, early, at an early age, and maybe it was kind of modelled from his father's apparent lack of a sense of responsibility. Then after Eton, Boris Johnson attended Oxford University. And again, for my foreign viewers, you probably know this, but it's similar to Eton. It's sort of seen as one of the best universities in the whole world certainly one of the best in England. And there he joined the notorious Bullingdon Club, which is a group of 23 privileged students who would li live like this ostentatious lifestyle, lots of booze, lots of women, lots of shenanigans, love that word, uh, including apparently once smashing up a restaurant. Uh, if you're English, you probably have heard that David Cameron, one of our ex-prime ministers had, how do I put this? allegedly had an over-amorous over, over amorous, uh, interaction with a pig's head. So why am I mentioning all of this? Well, I think, in my opinion, 
especially considering the background where Boris Johnson came from of being unloved and unsupported, having this privilege and being in the Bullingdon Club would have given him, I think, this inflated sense of self-importance. So he would have seen himself as like this, this person of distinction and he would have had this this reckless and blameless kind of lifestyle which would have just fed him and made him very entitled. So entitlement, I think, is a key aspect to Boris Johnson's character as a psychiatrist, and that is my diagnosis. So let's move on. So Boris Johnson then pursued power to achieve status amongst his peer, and he fed his addiction for attention that I mentioned before through his circle of friends. So he had rich, influential friends, in the media, in politics, then went into the media, went into politics. And this is where I think that we really see his adult personality traits blossom. So Boris Johnson was very good at presenting himself as like a friendly, affable, social, but kind of edgy, controversial figure. And he was definitely seen as everyone, by everyone around him as being quite ambitious to achieve maximum public attention. And then he started getting criticised for expressing views that were thought to be a bit self-serving rather than fact. And there's, there's several kind of um, specific examples of Boris Johnson uh, where he does that, where he says controversial things or things that are simply not true. I will go into some of those later on in this episode. But what I think is interesting is his first instinct when he's been caught out for lies, and this has continued since he's been Prime Minister, is to either deny them blame them for somebody else or give some sort of hollow apology and then just move on and sometimes even even repeat the same behaviour. So I think Boris Johnson is very good at blurring fact from fiction. I also think he's, much, he's quite an opportunist. So he's always had this need for attention and another way that that's co come out is he's pursued lovers. He's fathered several children, he's had several affairs. He's unable to have, to develop lasting friendships with men Due to dis, I think that's related to due to distrust in his father, and that's kind of reflected by all these people. Um, Dominic Cummings would be a good one, like all these people that were his advisors that he was close to, and then kind of threw under the bus. And he obviously cycles through women, so I reckon that's connected to his lack of consistent support and care from his mother, possibly copying misogynistic views from his father. Okay, so I said before that Boris Johnson has spent many years fabricating. Uh, lies to bring attention to himself. So I'm just going to give you now some examples of his lies. Excuse me, this is really distracting me. I'm just going to put that down there. Okay, so here's some examples of his lies. So Boris Johnson spent years ridiculing the Europe, European Union when he was a journalist, including writing a series of false stories in the Daily Telegraph. So he would make myths about Europeans banning British sausages, about different standardisation in condom sizes, and he even wrote something about the, uh, something false about the EU plan to legislate for acceptable curvature of bananas. I know this sounds like I'm taking the piss, but I kid you not, this is actually what he said. And none of this is true. When he was challenged upon it, he said it's just that he's just writing satire. And then moving forward to when he was Prime Minister, one of, one of his biggest lies was that he was very much pro-Brexit. He campaigned for it. Um, I'm sure anywhere, anybody listening to this anywhere around the world knows about the disaster that Brexit was. But Boris Johnson famously promised that there'd be £350 million extra per week for the NHS. Not only did he promise this, but he literally wrote it on the side of a big red battle bus. And then again, as I said, when he's been challenged to these kind of things, he's been said that he was just writing satire, which to me is very closely connected to the shaggy defence of it wasn't me. OK, let's get into some of the uh, lurid uh, accusations. So I am going to give you some examples of vitriolic and vulgar statements and offensive statements that he's made as a journalist. Before I do that, I'm just going to ask you a very quick question, dear viewers. I want to see if you know. Um, so this is for my Psych for Saw guys and gals. So Boris Johnson, as you know, has got in trouble with the law for breaking the lockdown, uh, lockdown rules. So my question is this. How many years has it been since an acting prime minister in the UK has broken the law? Answers later on in this episode. OK, so some of those vulgar statements. In 1995, Boris Johnson wrote an article describing the children of single mothers as, and I quote, ill-raised, ignorant, aggressive and illegitimate. It's not a good look. 
In 2002, Boris Johnson said colonialism in Africa should never have ended, and he downplayed Britain's role in the slave trade. In 2004, when he was the editor of The Spectator, he claimed that drunken fans were partially responsible for the Hillsborough tragedy. Again, for my foreign viewers who might not know, this is where 50 Liverpool fans were crushed to death um, during a football game. In 2018, he wrote in his column in the Daily Telegraph that, and I quote, the burqa is oppressive and Muslim women who wear the full veil look like letterboxes and bank robbers. And he kind of tried to pass it off as a bit of banter, but Islamophobia hate crimes increased by 375% in the week after this article appeared. So, you know, there's no smoke without fire. Interestingly, the Daily Telegraph paid him about £5,000 per article. So, you know, he's managed to weasel out a good salary there. In terms of more recent... Uh, slightly uncouth, vindictive outbursts, Boris Johnson told Sir Keir Starmer, who's the leader of the Labour Party, whilst he was the Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, also known as the DPP. Yeah, you know me. Sorry. Boris Johnson said that because he was the Director of Public Prosecutions, DPP, from 2008 to 2013, and was leading the Crown Prosecution Service, that he used his time pr persecuting journalists and failed to prosecute Jimmy Savile, who, as I'm sure you know, is a British TV personality, serial sex offender, hundreds of children. I've done another video on the psychoanalysis of him. Check it out on my channel. Uh, and this was an unfounded claim because there was, ev there was no evidence that Starmer had any personal role in the case of Jimmy Savile. So he, Boris Johnson was just being a, a nasty little man. In fact, the former Conservative Party leader, Michael Howard, twice fired Bojo as a minister because Johnson, when he was married with four children, lied to him about his love life and it later transpired that he had to have an abortion or his, his lover had to have an abortion for an unwanted pregnancy. Okay, let's circle back to the quote that I asked you about, dear viewers. I said to you, the quote was, there are no disasters, only opportunities and indeed opportunities for fresh disasters. Who is it that said that? That is, of course, a trick question. It was our man, Boris Johnson. He said that himself. And I think it's fairly on brand. It very much typifies, if that's a word, exactly what he is about. Okay, I'm going to tell you about a couple of really big controversies for Boris Johnson, then we'll sort of sum up his personality traits. So one of the biggest controversies is that during the Brexit campaign, which I stated before about the battle bus, £350,000 a week, he lied about benefits that countries would receive uh, he, there, uh, so what happened in Brexit was that there was um, the country experienced a shortage in supplies for manufacturing, for food, for the job market, energy costs, long lorry queues at the border. Uh, basically, Boris Johnson said the opposite of all of those things. All of those things happened, plus no extra money for the NHS. Another huge uh, controversy has to be the his the way that he handled the COVID situation in the UK. So he makes a claim that it's one of the highest percentage of the population was vaccinated, which I think is fair, that's correct. But that's really only a drop in the ocean considering that the UK deaths from COVID rank sixth amongst uh, the world's 206 countries. So just think about that, 206 countries in the world. The UK is one of the biggest um, economies. It's certainly supposed to be one of the most kind of highest achieving um technologically advanced countries and it ranks sixth in the highest death rate in the world that is mind-blowing and so far there have been 171,000 deaths uh, in the UK that have been related to COVID a lot of people are still not getting the treatment that they that they uh, need but Boris Johnson was criticized for not having the balance or the decision-making capability to balance the risk of COVID versus the economy of the nation and whilst this was happening the government made contracts with 40 businesses totaling 4.2 billion for PPE, which is personal protective equipment. And there's a lot of controversy because the High Court of England and Wales ruled against the fast track lane, which allowed government ministers and MPs to award contracts for lucrative PPE deals to a select number of businesses. And surprise, surprise, they helped out their friends. So their friends made loads and loads of money off this and Boris Johnson failed to act. At worst, he was implicit. At best, he didn't know about it. I know what I believe. Let me know what you think in the Schmummet Schmeckchens below downstairs. Okay, so in terms of other controversies, let's do the important stuff. This is what you wanted to hear. Boris is coming up, so you better get this party started. 
I'm talking about the Partygate revelations. So Boris Johnson not only attended a number of parties, 16 it's alleged, including one in his own flat, hard to deny, even though he did initially deny them and then admitted them when there was evidence against him. Not only did he attend them, but he actually instigated some of the parties. So there's a recent accusation that on a party on the Friday the 13th of November 2020, people just gathered, Boris came in and he started pouring the drinks. He started playing spin the bottle and he insisted that every politician play Twister. Okay, I made the last two bits up, but he did start pouring drinks uh, and he was seen as the very much the person who instigated this party. And remember, this was all happening during lockdown when the British public was making huge sacrifices. So Boris Johnson was literally breaking the law, breaking the law that he made and that he was telling the nations about only days or weeks earlier, whilst many people were not seeing friends and families, didn't, uh, weren't allowed guests to their, weren't allowed visitors to funerals and weren't allowed to visit hospitals to visit their own sick relatives. Okay, so dear viewers, my psych for sore guys and gals, are there any other scandals that you want to tell me about that you think are interesting and important when it comes to Boris Johnson? Okay, let's keep it moving. Let's wrap things up. So um, I'm going to summarise his personality traits and sort of psychological patterns. Then I'm going to bring in tying everything together to give you my final psychoanalysis like a pro. And most importantly, we're going to talk about how Boris Johnson hides in plain sight, in my opinion. I think that's one of his most manipulative and crafty character traits. But before I do that, let me introduce you to this channel. As I said before, my name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living in courts and prisons and psychiatric units. I act as an expert witness, so I give psychiatric expert witness uh, expert witness testimony in criminal trials. Uh, you can call me the ominous Shahominus. I am your favourite Asian, London-based, gold-toothed YouTuber, at least in your top three. This channel, A Sight for Sore Minds, offers a smorgasbord of material related to true crime with a little twist of psychiatry. I've done psychoanalysis of Putin, Tommy Robinson, the ex-BMP leader, of Jimmy Savile. I've done a video about grooming, so signs to watch out for if you think your child might be vulnerable to grooming, obvious for, and non-obvious signs. And I've talked about the Rotherham grooming scandal, uh, which is an absolute travesty in British law. So if you like your true crime with a twist of psychiatry, you have to check out the videos on my channel. I implore you to subscribe, because not only does it help me out immeasurably, but if you do subscribe, I promise that you'll never uh, run out of loo roll whilst you're going for a number two in a public place ever again in your life, guaranteed all your money back. Okay, let's get back to the video. So I'm just about to um, sub summarize Boris Johnson's background and his personality traits. So I said before, we get a picture of Boris Johnson growing up in a household that's, that's got domestic violence. Uh, his mother is often unwell and is in and out of hospital with depression. So he grows up in this environment with a lack of love and warmth. He has an emotionally unavailable father, a physically unavailable mother. Then he has glue ear until the age of eight, puts him in a lot of pain, gives him this evasiveness that he's kept throughout his life. But despite coming from all this trauma uh, and all this a turbulent kind of background. He's also very privileged. So he goes to Eton, Oxford, which can be seen as the cream of the cro absolute cream of the crop in terms of educational establishment. He's part of the Bullingdon Club. So in my opinion, this gives him this grandiose, inflated sense of self-importance. He thinks himself as a person of distinction, but at the same time, he can be reckless and blameless. He becomes very entitled. Then he starts his professional career. He sees himself as affable, sociable, controversial. He expresses these views that gets him attention. Uh, sometimes he gets called out for his BS and he just blames it on other people or denies his lies. I think Boris Johnson is an opportunist. So I think he needs attention. Uh, and those two things combined also explains why he is, how do I put this nicely, sexually quite liberal, let's say that. He's pursued many women. He's had lots of different, several children, which I think shows a lack of kind of loving connection relationships, a lack of empathy, shows manipulation. All of this is tied to him being grandiose and titled. I think you're getting the picture. Okay, so a quick question for you, my psych for sore mind uh, viewers, my guys and gals. I asked you before, I think I asked you this before, how many years has it been since an acting prime minister has broken the lockdown rules? And the answer is, sorry, any, any rule. So has broken the law, apologies. 
So the answer is, it's a trick question, no acting Prime Minister has broken the law before Boris Johnson. This is the first time in history this has happened. Okay, let's keep it moving. I ain't got the time for shucking and jiving. My final thought on my psychoanalysis of Boris Johnson is this. I think part of his persona, as I mentioned before, is how he manages to hide in plain sight. So I think the very fact that Boris Johnson is outlandish, he's larger than life, he's dangling down from um, sky wire harnesses, he's having affairs with boxing American women, nobody actually knows how many children he has, and he is, he's very atypical, he's very different from your average politician. So just like Trump, I think that people are fed up and tired uh, and they don't trust these boring, dull, Dr. Grande type politicians. So I think a lot of people voted for him on the basis of his performance, of his sort of character, because he's funny, because he seemed more like a kind of mascot with, with waffly hair than anything else. But I think that the tide is turning. I think people are starting to, to raise very serious questions about his competence and his trustworthiness. So he can't just laugh it off, he can't just wink into the crowd. Um, they might have voted for him for that reason, but they're not excusing his behaviour anymore. So I guess what I'm saying is I think Bojo has lost his mojo. When I talk about hiding in plain sight, it does remind me of Jimmy Savile, only because I did a video on him recently on my channel. Go check it out. Always be plugging. Now, I'm not saying for a second that Boris Johnson did anything as heinous as, you know, all those, that prolific sexual abuse. I'm not saying that. I don't want to get taken out by MO5. don't want to get shot in the head from distance by James Bond. But... I guess what I'm saying is I wonder whether it's whether this uh, this buffoonery and this love of whiff waff is all this carefully calibrated performance. So a bit like Jimmy Savile, I think because he's so odd and so bizarre, people it's almost like a scrote stream. So it's hard for him to pick out uh, the callousness and the calculated nature of what he's doing. What I'm talking about is the art of distraction. So I think we're looking at a clown who's actually a master beside the scenes. And I think it's changing. I think people are getting angry. There's been too much incompetence, too many mistakes, too many lives lost over COVID. But I'll leave you with this final thought. The scary thing is, is even though he's getting caught for all these things and getting criticised, I don't think Boris Johnson actually cares. I think he's happy as long as he gets to stay in power. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, I'm going to go now. I just want to say that I'm going to be at CrimeCon on June the 11th and 12th, I believe, in London. If you want to come along, it is this huge true crime convention where you'll have a number of expert speakers from podcasters to um, ex-detectives uh, to psychologists, psychiatrists such as myself, and we're going to dissect loads of high-profile cases. You should come along. If you want 10% off your ticket, use the code PSYCH. Details in the comments section below. Go and check out all my videos. Go and buy my book. It's called Into Minds. It is dope. It's about my personal cases in my life as a forensic psychiatrist. Buy a copy or I'll come and kill you. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Stay euthymic. And please remember, whatever happens, do not forget. I love you. <laughs>